From the city of Leipzig, Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi changed the world of music. We want to know how. And that's why Leipziger Volkszeitung's culture journalist Werner Kopfmüller is today speaking with the Korean pianist Song Jin Cho. He will be with the Gewandhaus Orchestra at Mendelssohn Festival Leipzig 2023. This is Alles Felix, the podcast of Mendelssohn Haus Leipzig and Leipziger Volkszeitung. Welcome, Mr. Cho. I'm very thankful. I'm very pleased that you are hosting me at your beautiful apartment here in Berlin. You made your Gewandhaus debut last year. And you played with the Gewandhaus Orchestra and you will return to Leipzig to play with the Gewandhaus Orchestra this year for the Mendelssohn Festival in November. Last time you went to Leipzig, you told me you regarded it as some kind of homework to visit the Mendelssohn House. So maybe you can just share your impressions of this museum. Well, Leipzig is for sure uh, one of the most important city in terms of music and culture in Germany and I was lucky that I had time to visit Mendelssohn House, Mendelssohn Museum last year, but unfortunately I didn't have so much time to visit other museums like Bach hmm. Museum. So yeah, probably I'll visit more places next time um, when I visit Leipzig again. And yeah, it was fascinating to see the museum and not only for the museum, but the church and then the cities and the building. I could feel the history of the city. Yes, and I mean, with the Bach Museum, it's of course not authentic. It's just a museum presenting some information about Bach in a very shiny way. But the Mendelssohn House is really the house he lived and died in, and that makes it very special, I suppose. And the floor, the wooden floor, is the floor he, right, right. <laughs> he went on. And yeah, but interesting that you preferred Mendelssohn over Bach for your first visit. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody having to do with classical music, interested in classical music, will know that you made some international headlines in 2015 as the first prize winner at the International Chopin competition in Warsaw, arguably the most prestigious piano competition in the world. Of course, this is years ago. But you have since established an international career and you have went on in your repertoire, of course. But isn't there still the risk of being received solely as a Chopin specialist? I'm not sure, but, you know, I didn't want to be labeled as a Chopin yes, specialist. Yeah. Of course, being a Chopin specialist is a very special thing. But I just wanted to play other composers' music as well, not only Chopin. So in the calendar year 2019, I didn't play Chopin's solo music intentionally. But I guess there's no worries anymore because not every orchestra or promoters, they don't ask me anymore to play only Chopin's program. So, <laughs> yeah. But in the first years, you were always asked to render pure Chopin program for recitals. Yes, um, especially in the calendar year 2016, mm. when I played recital, for example, in London or in, in Poland, they asked me to play like complete Chopin program. And then, of course, I was pleased to do because as a Chopin prize winner, it is an honor to play Chopin's music. Was there ongoing with your triumph at the competition, was there any new pieces by Chopin you had to learn anew? Or had you prepared the whole catalog? So I think I've learned almost, <laughs> except for a few scarce number, number one and three, the Chopin's music that I played after I won the competition was that I've already learned before the Chopin competition. For example, like Ballad, Complete Ballad, Or sonata number two. Ah, yes, Son sonata number three. I I learned it was, it was a new piece. So maybe yeah. first sonata. The first sonata <laughs> I haven't done yet, <laughs> but the third sonata, yes, I had to learn after I won the Chopin competition. But yeah, I think most of the music by Chopin that I played since I won was that I learned before the Chopin competition. And all the etudes, I suppose, both cycles. Well, I. <laughs> My technique is not good enough to play these etudes. You know, I was at the Chopin competition and 
I was number 10. That means I had to play on the first day of the competition and we had to play two different etudes and it was uh, painful because yes, yes, yes. No, <laughs> it was painful for me. Is... I mean, not only because of that, but I just didn't enjoy playing etudes because it is so hard. Yes, Musically, it is a wonderful piece, but I would rather uh, listen to Polini's version <laughs> rather than mine. So. <laughs> So I was really, really happy that it was over after the first day. Yes, but uh, I suppose all of us would enjoy if you played them to us on stage. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but uh, moving on from Chopin, who was, a, let's say, a colleague of Mendelssohn. And astonishingly, all of them, Chopin, Mendelssohn, Schumann, Liszt, were born at the same, same, generation. Yeah. same generation, yes. And... All of them were pianists and piano composers. How would you, in your own words, briefly characterize the differences between them? What do they mean to you? Just in a few words. Talking about Mendelssohn, I think there are two famous composers who are underrated. One is Haydn, one is Mendelssohn. Of course, they're famous, but compared to, let's say, Mozart or Beethoven, They're less performed these days. And I simply couldn't understand why they're less popular. And I asked my friends and my colleagues regarding this kind of thing. They said Mendelssohn's music has less emotional depth than, for example, or Brahms or Beethoven. And I didn't agree with them because I couldn't agree with them. Because if you, if you hear Oratorio Elia yeah. by Mendelssohn, It has incredible emotional depth. So I just hope that more people can discover this kind of uh, different music other than like Song Without Words, which is fantastic and most popular piece by Mendelssohn. But yeah, so I have played not so much of solo piano music by Mendelssohn, but I've done many chamber music like oh. Trio Number no. One and Two, D minor and C minor. And there's Mendelssohn sextet with two violas, one violin, one cello, and one double bass and piano. I've done when I was 14 or 15 years old. And also double concerto in D minor with the violin and, and piano. What I like about Mendelssohn music is there's a really good balance between the classical refinement yes. and romantic expression. There's so good balance and His music in general is very elegant and yes. lyrical. Um, yeah, that's what I like about Mendes. Yes, and I mean, it's very elegant and that leads to the issue that some state it lacks emotional depth. And uh, But that's definitely wrong. But pianists tend to focus just on variation sérieuse and maybe the fantasy yeah and, and that's quite it yeah. Yeah. Uh, and even yeah. those two aren't performed that often right in the future maybe i'd like to discover more of his piano music and i've already have i have a plan to play both piano concerto in two three years so ah, okay yeah i need to learn <laughs> and record as well i don't know yet okay, <laughs> okay. So we can be looking forward mm -hmm. to what you will discover in Mendelssohn's catalog and present to us. Did you recently play chamber music? When I played a recital with Andy Ottenzama, he's a clarinet player, he made his own transcription, Lido de Vota. Yes. And then, yeah, I did several pieces. And then also with Sol Gabetta, there was a transcription. Ah, that was, I could find it on, on YouTube, I suppose. I think, yeah. I think so. Yeah. There was, this was in, in a church in Switzerland. Yes, yeah. yes. And yeah, there was a transcription for cello and piano. So I did that, but not solo music recently. Yeah. Going back from Mendelssohn to the past and at the same time to the present, your current CD, The Handel Project, Is somehow connected to Mendelssohn, who drew lots of inspiration from Handel for his oratorios and was very involved with the music of Handel. How comes that you went back to a Baroque master? What appealed to you? Well, I, I always wanted to play Baroque music and I simply didn't have chance 
to play and then I thought it was about time to play and record baroque music and I discovered Handel's music mm -hmm. keyboard music during the pandemic and I found it to be very interesting and beautiful mm -hmm. and it was not so easy because I'm not so familiar with baroque music I I have done so many like classical period music, romantic and also 20th century music, but not so much Baroque. So it was a good experience for me and, and I learned a lot during the process. And yeah, it was, even if I try to, how can I say, reproduce the harpsichord sound on the modern piano, it is almost impossible. Yes. But I just try to imitate the sound or feeling of the harpsichord. But of course, there's a better side of modern piano, which I think it has more colors. Yes, definitely. So I try to keep that advantages. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, it has its pros and cons to play on a period instrument, historical keyboard instrument. But did you familiarize yourself with the harpsichord? Have you ever tried to? Oh, yeah. Um, I had a chance... When I was in Bamberg, oh. there was a harpsichord in the storage, oh. and I, I didn't tell anyone in the orchestra, <laughs> <laughs> but I think I played on that harpsichord for many hours. Oh, okay. It was May 2022, so it was totally different. It requires totally different technique, and it was not easy. So, but I learned something from. Mm -hmm. it. And this was your first encounter with a. Well, I, when I was a student at yes. the Paris Conservatory, there was a harpsichord and I just played yeah. just maybe for five minutes. But yeah. It was not obligatory No, no. for the studies. It was an yeah. option. It was optional. Yeah, okay. optional. Yeah. Ah, okay, so it can be inspiring, I would say, to get the imagination of the sound and to somehow transfer it to the modern piano and enrich it with the colors that the right. modern piano offers. Um, you chose Handel for a CD recording. Um, why did I choose? Yeah, I don't know, because <laughs> <laughs> for me, Bach music, I respect Bach, and mm. someday I'll love to explore more. Mm. But I simply felt that I'm not ready to record Bach yet. I'm not saying that I'm, I felt ready to record Handel's music, But Handel's music is more melodic, while Bach's music is more intellectual. Yes, definitely. So for me, as a Baroque music beginner, it was easier to understand and follow Handel's music better. So that made me to record uh, the Handel's recording. One track, one piece on your album is an arrangement by Wilhelm Kempf, right. which is quite known and very beautiful. Have you ever considered arranging yourself? I've tried once, a few times, and then I somehow always discover better versions <laughs> out there. And also, like, I try to write some uh, cadenzas, oh, yeah. like Mozart concerto cadenzas, and then I also could find out a better version which already have written before. So I don't think I'm good at writing or composing. So you didn't have the courage so far to present it to the public, Not to the yet. audience? Not okay. yet. <laughs> yeah, but I think that was quite common uh, with pianists from the past, like Wilhelm Kempf. They composed, they arranged. Right. That was not that strictly separated. And they were musicians. And, yes. Uh, and also like Liszt, he was a great pianist, a yeah. great composer yeah. at the same time. So maybe the people in the past, they're more talented. <laughs> I would not say it's uh, about talent. It's about education, I would say. Maybe. Education uh, tends to be very specialized nowadays. Yes, you're right. And of course, you have to be specialized in something because the competition is so harsh, so right. hard. Um, so, it's a different time. Yeah. Yes, different time, but at the time of Mendelssohn, Schumann also lived and composed in Leipzig. They were not just colleagues, they were friends, and Mendelssohn supported Schumann, premiering his works. You will be coming to Leipzig for the Mendelssohn Festival, but not performing Mendelssohn, but the Schumann Concerto, the great Schumann Concerto. I think it's always a new discovery uh, to play it with a, an orchestra, because it's... I would call it a concerto that is an 
all in one concerto. So we have everything in it. And the piano part is very closely, neatly combined with interwoven with the orchestral part. What is the challenge for you with this concerto? Uh, especially this concerto, the orchestra part is so important. Schumann great at writing chamber music. Mm. I love his piano quintet, piano quartet, and especially this concerto is like a bigger version of chamber music. There's a um, continuous dialogue between the orchestra and the piano, and it is so important to to communicate with the conductor as well. It is all about the communication and or dialogue between mm -hmm. the orchestra, and each movements they have all different characters. And first movement, there's an uh, like so big emotional ups and downs. And, yeah. And the second movement is like a child is very innocent and pure. And third movement uh, shares a great emotional uh, explosion, which is very positive. And I would say it is a little bit like a Beethoven concerto, piano concerto, which also has a dialogue between the orchestra and the piano. And of course, Schumann liked Beethoven's music. And then I think I read somewhere that Schumann didn't like the concept of the concerto. And yes. then I think he just tried to make it as a like big version of chamber music, and I could clearly feel that. And I'm so looking forward to playing this piece with the Gavantas Orchestra. I don't need to explain how they <laughs> great they are. So, yeah, I'm looking forward. Yes, and we do as well, of course. We are very much looking forward. And interestingly, the first movement of the Schumann Concerto was intended to be a movement on its own. Mm -hmm. So he just extended the concerto afterwards. He composed the first movement and... In his idea, that was it. And then he <laughs> talked to his publisher and he said, it's better you <laughs> you offer uh, three movements. And so he composed two other yeah. movements. So, yeah, that means that the range of emotions in the first movement is um, really It's big. big yeah. yeah, You have this section in the middle which leads to another atmosphere. I mean, you have... With Schumann, two opposite characters often in his personality. You know about yeah, course, Floristan yeah. and Eusebius. Who predominates in the concerto for you? Oh, it's <laughs> difficult. <laughs> <laughs> well, it really depends on the interpretation. And whenever I play Schumann's music, I could feel there's some love mm. in the music. Kind of, I don't know, how can I... The, uh, the definition of love is very tricky and it's hard to explain. But anyway, it is somehow dramatic and poetic. Mm. And maybe in 10 years, I might play differently. Yes. Mm -hmm. But now I feel like this concerto, especially this concerto, and especially the last movement is... It's like an explosion. Like explosion of, uh, of but a positive uh, explosion. Positive, yeah. 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 Very emotional. But I will not play like, for example, like Tchaikovsky way or Rachmaninoff, this kind of romanticism. It's different. Yeah. But anyway, there is a very positive explosion, emotional explosion in the piece. So I will try to play it very emotionally, I guess. And does it have a happy end? I guess so. But <laughs> whenever I play the ending of the the concerto, the last movement, the coda, I could feel there's so much of hope. The harmony changes, they're so touching and quite repetitive, but yeah. still there's yearning, like yeah. yearning feeling or like seeking for hope. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to explain. <laughs> no, I mean, we will hear it. We will listen to, you will be playing it three times in Leipzig with the Gewandtas Orchestra on the 2nd, 3rd and the 4th of November under the baton of Andres Nelsons. Have you ever performed with him? Oh yeah, a few times, a few times. In, in Berlin, in Boston. Yeah, he's, he's a wonderful musician and human being and he's a very natural musician. Yeah, I can confirm. <laughs> <laughs> But that's not the end of the journey. Journey is the key word because 
you will be going on on tour. All oh, right, yeah. <laughs> With the Gewandtes yeah. Orchestra. And that will be quite special for you, I suppose, because you will be going on a tour to Korea and Japan. Yes, especially whenever I play in Seoul. Mm. I get more nervous than usual, but... I think with this orchestra, with this great orchestra, I will enjoy a lot. So it's a, a mixture of feelings. It's You feel a bit more under pressure? I grew up in, in Seoul and I moved to Paris when I was 18 years old. And I went to Seoul Art Center mm -hmm. where we'll be performing with the orchestra so often when I was a middle school student. So probably unconsciously, whenever I, I'm there, I feel more nervous because I feel like I'm home or what <laughs> but yeah it's hard Many to explain memories yeah. coming alive right and, uh, and for sure is it will be packed the audience it will be crowded it will be sold out the concert halls I suppose um, and uh, there yeah, will be a lot yeah. of enthusiasm <laughs> yeah I cannot wait for this how comes that it will be such a frenzy is so enthusiastic about your concerts in, in Korea. How comes the love of classical music, especially with young people? I was asked this question so many times by you got tired <laughs> answering uh, it. European American <laughs> journalists, but so I was thinking about this and I think because Korean people they're a little bit more open minded. So, yeah, like there's there's a stereotype about classical music that is uh, classical music is a little bit boring. It is for rich people. It is for old people. That means rich people, it was kind of a status symbol, you mean? Yeah, it is a stereotype, like there's a prejudice. But I think in Korea, th this kind of thing doesn't exist. There's no boundary. That's why people in Korea could easily go to the classical concert. There's no severe atmosphere in the concert hall where sometimes I could feel in some certain European cities, like people have to wear a like, suit or a tuxedo in the concert hall, but it's not like that in Korea. So I think that's why people can enjoy classical music. I mean, young people can enjoy classical mu music easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But this atmosphere is not that severe, but at the same time, people listen very carefully. It's not that... I guess so, yeah. yeah. When they're into it, they become more serious, yeah. And the applause afterwards? Are there standing ovations instantly? Um, depending on the quality of the performance. <laughs> <laughs> As always, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mr. Cho, thank you very much for your time, for having me here, for being guest in our podcast, Alles Felix. And we are very much looking forward to your performance in Leipzig at the Mendelssohn Festival, the Gewandtas Orchestra, on the 2nd, 3rd and 4th of November. See you there and goodbye. See you there. Thank you. That was Alles Felix, a podcast of Mendelssohn House Leipzig and Leipziger Volkszeitung. You were listening to the music journalist Dana Kopfmüller and the Korean pianist Song Jin Cho. On the websites of Mendelssohn House Leipzig and Leipziger Volkszeitung and on all podcast channels. Thank you for listening. Music